Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. These are the texts for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost on September 26th. The first reading is Numbers 11 selected verses. If you're following the semi-continuous first reading, that is Esther, various verses from chapters 7 and 9. The psalm is 19, 7 through 14. Our second reading is our last in a series on James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 through 50. Lots to talk about. Lots of selected verses, lots of things to do, but also one of the hardest texts in year B from the Gospel of Mark, I think, for preaching. And we're actually at the start of uh, four pretty challenging texts uh, in Mark as well. So uh, get ready, ordinary time. Uh, Mark and discipleship is no picnic uh, at all. Um, and so we'll have to not just understand that, but also take us into the figures of speech Jesus uses, take us into some of the cultural differences, take us into the ways in which the text is just plain uh, hard, because I think for Mark, uh, that's what discipleship is. Hard. Well, I, I, yeah, I think that's an important point, Matt. Uh, first off is just is to recognize that we're, we are moving into some really challenging texts. And so for the preacher to look ahead, like next week we have the divorce text and here, you know, uh, the, the challenges of, of how is it that we prevent others from uh, relationships with, with God and with Jesus. And so looking ahead, I think is really uh, critical, particularly as you, as the pastor, as the preacher realize where some of these texts might land uh, when they're heard and, uh, and knowing what your congregation is experiencing. And I think the other thing about, uh, to remember about these texts is the, the fact that we're, the location of them is so fascinating, right? I guess that's a word. I don't know if fascinating is the right word, but you know, we've, we're, we've had the, the confession of you are the Messiah, Caesarea Philippi in chapter eight, and then, and then move through these passion predictions in chapter nine, eight, nine, and 10. And here's where discipleship really is is a central focus right for for mark and so just that contrast between some of the hardest passages uh, in mark about discipleship along with the reality of what jesus will be facing uh you know in a couple of chapters that that contrast that juxtaposition is worth i think some homiletical thought as well just to say that yeah, it, 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 this, this difficulty matches, if you will, what Jesus is predicting about his own ministry. And uh, there, there, there needs to be some connection, I think, there or some sort of correlation between, uh, between those realities, if that makes sense. Absolutely. I mean, I think I mentioned this <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, the more Mark discloses about who Jesus is, the more Mark discloses what discipleship looks like. And those go hand. And the harder it gets. <laughs> right. And there's repetition yeah. here in terms of misunderstanding and all of this. There's also repetition in a kind of opening or a kind of generosity that, look, this way of following is open to any. The language is tough there in verses 38 through 41. The or the figures of speech are, are tough to get the bottom of, but there's a generosity there where Jesus says, essentially, look, when you're in a war against evil, uh, when you're in a war against the forces of, of chaos and destruction, don't worry about what uniform somebody's wearing. You know, if somebody is doing the work that you, that, that supports our work, uh, rejoice and be glad in that, that the stakes are incredibly high. Um, the other thing, I, too, that you might want to put into context is to imagine when Mark's written, <clears throat> excuse me, if it is written indeed around the year 70, it's this reminder, right? You wanted a Messiah. You, you might have thought the Messiah would be somebody who would preserve the temple. You might have thought the Messiah would be somebody who would expel the Romans. You might have thought the Messiah would be somebody who would return in glory and protect you from the suffering that you're facing now uh, in, in the imperial climate. Why did you think that? <laughs> You know, Mark's going back to over and over again, this need for um, putting oneself last and for a generosity and openness to the other. And that'll come out maybe most clearly in 
three weeks from today when we're at the end of Mark chapter 10. But that it's, again, this reminder to people who are perhaps living in a time of, of pretty serious chaos and disappointment uh, that this is the way of the crucified Messiah. This is the way, uh, this is what it means to call Jesus uh, the Christ. And you have to look at not just things like the transfiguration or the baptism or all the miracles. You've got to look at the death and you've got to look at um, uh, the rejection, the humiliation, the suffering. And that's too what uh, I think in a, a critical focus, because it's not just on, you know, the spotlight is not just on Jesus and his messiahship, but really how much the spotlight is on uh, the, the disciples and what discipleship is going to mean, that sort of cruciform reality of what discipleship is in, in Mark. And because you get the context, like right before this chapter, uh, or a couple verses before, the, di the disciples could not cast out a demon, right, in, in verses 9, 14 through 29. And here they're like, you know, somebody else was trying to cast out a demon, but we tried to stop him. And, and so you just, and then, and, you know, in three weeks, we'll get, you know, James and John wanting a place at the head of the table. And so it's just this, it's, it's a really, uh, I think, an important exposure, revelation of, of, of the human condition with regard to what does it mean to follow Jesus and this kind of you know competition or wanting the first place or uh, uh, and, and at the same time the irony of not recognizing what all of this means and so I think that I think that irony too you also could play with a little bit homiletically is to say yeah that this is you know they they. Uh, they they want to be able to do what Jesus does yet yet they don't really and they don't want anybody else to do it uh but they but they don't really realize what that means so that would be another I think it's another really important aspect about this text I think uh as always Cliff Black is very helpful uh, he's got the commentary on the website this week you know and he starts off he starts off uh in his way saying that this lection contains uh, things that drive the conscientious into a slew of despondence, um, exorcisms, multiple disturbances in the Greek text. And by the way, only a biblical scholar would say, yep, exorcisms and disturbances in the text. Uh, uh, th those they two are things. both sources of chaos. Yes, yeah, they're, <laughs> um, but then, and then he goes on to say, you know, um, hard saying of, of Jesus that are logically incoherent. I mean, that is, for instance, if salt has lost its saltiness, uh, which is actually physically impossible, salt is a rock. It cannot, there, there's no way for salt to lose its saltness. So obviously it's a metaphor uh, that you're trying to play with. Um, the thing that strikes me uh, really is there's, you know, two big sections or maybe three of this passage. And again, Cliff, uh, on the website gives a nice introduction to that really for the next few weeks. And this is the last week he's writing for us in this series, but um, be sure to read it, um, re uh, read his commentary. But uh, th at the start is the name of Jesus. Uh, it's, it says, we saw, as Carolyn just said, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We told him to stop because they were not following us. I mean, there is something about church leaders that we really want to make it about us. And even if we don't want to, in the end, somehow it invariably does become about us, our team, our denomination, our congregation, we the leaders. Um, but then it goes on, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ. I think most people are, are familiar with the other way of that same saying, which I think is in another gospel, uh, whoever gives a cup of water in the name of Christ. But here it's if you receive one because you bear the name of Christ. Um, so I, the name of Jesus Christ is uh, essential to those, to tying together what's going on um, at the front uh, of this uh, lection. And then at the end, it's all the stuff about stumbling uh, or in the middle, I should say, all the stuff about stumbling. If your hand uh, or your foot or your eye causes you to stumble and stumble, okay, I'll move to the psalm, not really to the psalm, but stumbling is such a metaphor in uh, in the psalms for uh, when life goes wrong. You know, it says in Psalm 121, he, he will not cause your foot to stumble and so on. So what is it that uh, you guys, what is it about stumbling 
that is a powerful metaphor for the life of faith or, or life in general going wrong? What do you think? Well, I, uh, I don't know if this is quite, uh, quite the answer, but I, but just, but I appreciate this, this focusing on that word. That's where I, I really wanted to go next that, and Cliff Black talks about the fact that the primary meaning of the Greek word uh, scandal on is a trap for catching a live animal. And I, I, I think that in, when you, when you think about this passage and it's, it, it's so easy to distance yourself from that, you know, oh, I'm not going to do that. Kind of like the disciples, you know, I'm not, I, that's not something that I do, but to really to get people to think about the way in which uh, they trap others into uh, thinking, thinking, thinking things about Jesus that they, that, that are, that are not true to themselves or that, you know, the way in which we engage in this kind of, um, this trapping and this kind of um, blocking people from uh, a relationship with Jesus that might be true to them, but you don't think is true to you, if that makes sense. So at that, that's kind of, um, I don't have it all sort of figured out yet, but that's kind of where I find that really intriguing, just to that focus on uh, an acknowledgement of the ways in which either, either majorly or minorly, we um, stand, bef we, we stand uh, in the way, we are in the way of people, or we put up, uh, we put in certain, um, certain stipulations for what uh, that relationship looks like. So uh, that's kind of where I was going. It's a good question, right? What is it about stumbling that's, that's dangerous? I, I, I figure it's because the older I get, the, the longer it takes me to recover when I, <laughs> when I twist a shoulder in the wrong way, or I, uh, or turn an angle and hiking or something. <laughs> it takes weeks. Uh, but there's a danger there to, to myself, but to others is part mm -hmm. of it too, that I think is, is what's going on in the biblical text, especially in this context here. And, and Cliff Black's commentary helped me see this in a new way this time around, that it's, it's about putting stumbling blocks before others, but also one's own stumbling, one's own, whatever that looks like in terms of uh, of how your body falls out of a rhythm can be really dangerous for others. And that's what I think is partly what's going on here and why the, the hyperbole is so severe that um, Jesus hates bad religion. Jesus hates religion that's harmful to others. Jesus hates um, a piety or a devotion that ends up harming others. Just of course he hates predatory behavior or tyrann tyrannical behavior or things like that, that that inhibits somebody else's, I want to use this word carefully, but freedom. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Rolf? Is that, a, is that a question you already knew the answer to? Or? No, as you know, I, I um, on this podcast, I try only to ask questions that I don't have an answer to. Um, that's not always true in Bible class in uh, Luther Seminary. Sometimes I actually do uh, have an answer in mind, but uh, it's generally, a, no, I, I, I don't know. Um, I do know that um, being in a wheelchair and, and being a double amputee at this stage of my life when I can no longer, uh, I used to be able to just, if I, if I sat on the ground, I could just throw, literally kind of throw myself up into my wheelchair. I can't do that anymore. I'm not, so I'm now way more careful when I'm out and about by myself. Um, and, and as my mom uh, who died last year got really frail, full of arthritis, you just do become aware of stumbling. Um, this, this summer, my wife broke her ankle quite severely. And I just was thinking as she did it, you know, she's got three plates and 16 screws in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in the age world, even when you're healthy, if you stumbled and broke something, and of course the text doesn't say that, but if you did, there was no way to repair it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it is something, uh, there is something about permanent, I mean, it's a significant danger. I mean, you could kind of paraphrase it. If you put someone else in significant danger, um, it'd be better, you know, if you were thrown into the lake. And the gravity of that response, I think, I mean, obviously it's hy hyperbolic, but, you know, to imagine uh, that, 
when when that happens or when you do that, it would be better if a great millstone, which is yeah. what you know animals would have, uh, uh, and then you're thrown into the sea, which means you're going to drown. And so just that that the gravity of it, I think that's part of what you, a preacher needs to think about. This is not just like uh, this is not just a little thing. This is uh, this is the ways in which we are causing that, and that that and that 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 matters. And it's, there's an incredible gravity behind that. Yeah. It's one of the things that might link what we're seeing in the next several weeks, right? It's behavior that has the potential to hurt others or to mm-hmm. hurt innocents. Um, um, we even see that with the money in, with the rich man in, in Mark 10. I mean, I think that's part of what's going on to kind of hold some things together here. It's not, this isn't necessarily Jesus lifting up his least favorite sins or something like that. It's that what does it look like to create a well-functioning community where, where, um, where those who are vulnerable have their security protector, their, I don't want to say rights, because that's not the right word either, but kind of what you were saying, Rolf, too, about the, um, what, what would it mean to put a stumbling block in front of somebody in a way that's going to do great damage to their, to their bodies, to their well-being, to their ability to, to have a livelihood, those types of things are part of what's going on here. I think another yeah. thing that, oh, I think another thing that going forward that's helpful is that um, that kind of part of what part of what a stumbling block means is that you you don't you aren't aware of the other, uh, and so there's a kind of a turning in on oneself. I think too that that is a, that's a theme in the in these next passages. Go ahead, Rolf. Well, I was just going to say that um, we probably need to move on, but um, mm-hmm. to, uh, just to go back to the, to the very start, which is there ought to be a hum- I mean, this this lesson, if nothing else, calls for great humility as a Christian leader, um, mm-hmm. right? Because it starts off with the disciples saying, hey, they should be following us. And Jesus says, no, no, if, you know, listen, if they're using my name, um, that's a good thing. And so it's really a warning against the sort of sectarianism in Christianity that I think we're mostly past in terms of the violence between uh, Christian uh, groups. Um, but there is, a, there's still a lot of hubris uh, that uh, of, of certain Christian groups, or I should say certain people within every Christian group um, that is to be um, guarded against. Numbers 11. I know, right? The best thing I learned about this is that the word rabble appears only here. <laughs> the great word, the rabble. Yes. The rabble had very... a strong craving. Well, this is obviously, I think, obviously, he said, uh, you know, paired to say basically, stop trying to limit the work of God among people that you think are unauthorized. Yeah. Uh, and so that regard, it's probably cl- most helpful for the first couple of verses of the Mark reading, or just preach it on your own. It's a great text about the freedom of God's spirit to, um, to shape and move a community and about the, the, the folly of religious leaders trying to set up boundaries for how God's spirit can operate. Poor Joshua. <laughs> Get his revenge down the road, though, don't worry. <laughs> no, I agree. I mean, it's... Uh, I would have rather, by the way, that the... Uh, the people who chose the lectionary paired this with like Leviticus 19, where it says, you shall not revile the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. I think that would have been a nicer, more, cons- mm-hmm. that's the whole lesson, just that verse. Uh, <laughs> Leviticus 19, what is that? It's like 1914, then boom, you're done. It, uh, it's clear, it's the stumbling block, don't put one in front of a blind person, but, which really then kind of connects nicely with the images of handicapped bodies in Matthew, but they didn't. So, uh, and if you, if you're not the kind of person that would just switch that out, I think your reader would help your old Testament reader, lay reader would be happy short lesson. But, um, I I like what you said about the, um, the freedom of the spirit. Um, and that is really a theme, uh, throughout the old Testament is the freedom of the spirit to fall upon whom the spirit, uh, chooses to fall upon. And I think that's pretty, again, that does pair up really nicely with the first, mm-hmm. the first part of the gospel lesson. I wish we knew what Eldad and Medad were saying. They're prophesying in the camp. They're probably saying, quit complaining. They're probably saying, it's Joshua, manna, eat the manna. 
They're probably saying Joshua and Moses aren't all that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably true too. I just like I they, they like I like the meal that they want. I mean, you know, fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. So I know great. They long for the flesh pots of Egypt, oh, don't they? Oh man, sounds delicious. Well, um, you know, Esther, it's you got to preach on Esther at least once in your preaching career. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if this is the Sunday you want to do it or not, but it's a shame. I believe this is the only time the lectionary settles in on, less, on Esther. Is that correct? I can well, look it's, really fast. And but it's we're not, basically charged and, with, go ahead. Well, it's in, in the, it does, but it's in the semi-continuous. So yeah, that's what I was going to ask if it's, uh, <laughs> It only it. I don't think it ever occurs. I don't think after Esther ever occurs in the, in the RCL. Well, in the the churches that use the thematically linked Old Testament series, it never occurs. No. And for those that use the um, the semi continuous, this is the only time. So hey, yeah. this is yeah. your time to preach on Esther. Yeah, which yeah. is a hilarious story. Um, you know, it's got all sorts of. Uh, speaking about hyperbole, Matt, uh, it's got all sorts of hyperbole. You know, the story starts off with the king throwing a half year long feast, right? Uh, uh, 180 days. And, uh, you know, and then it ends and there's all sorts of other hyperbolic aspects of it. But it ends then really with Esther uh, taking her moment of vocation. Perhaps it is for this moment that you have come into the kingdom. Esther and she 14. uses it. I would go back to that. Or Esther four. You have, you have I to would preach. Go back to that. You have to preach the whole book. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, if I mean, you basically have to tell the story in such a way, I think that it draws people in, so that it, so then the question is, where do I find myself in the story? Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, it's pretty good for people to find themselves uh, in the story in Esther, and you know, she does an incredibly risky thing. Uh, she breaks the law. By going into the king's presence, but she does it because um, the life of her people is at stake, and so she uh, she goes in, and then you know is uh, um, I guess I can't find the right word, but she risks everything, and uh, the king sides with her, uh, and then of course this becomes in Judaism this story is read at Purim. And Purim uh, is um, in the winter, so it's not close to now. We've just come through the uh, the Jewish High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah, and the Day of Atonement. Um, but it's you know still you can do a little um, interreligious uh, education there about um, why the story is important uh, within Judaism. I think it's an also uh, yeah, I, and I think also it's an, an opportunity to lift up. Uh, Women uh, characters in the Bible. Uh, it's what what one of how many books is it that are named after women? Ruth, Esther. Is that it? No. That's it. That's it. You're right. Okay, two. Whew. Uh, and uh, but but not only Esther, but then in as you were mentioning, uh, Rolf, the first chapter uh, about Vashti, who also risks uh, risks her life by saying no to King Ahasuerus and uh, saying, I'm not coming to your drunken brawl. Uh, thank you very much. And we don't know what happened to her. So there is, um, there, there's a, I think there's an opportunity here as well for preachers to lift up these, um, these really yeah. strong female characters in mm -hmm. scripture that, that risk, uh, risk so much for the sake of their own, um, uh, for the sake of their own identity. And, uh, and that's, I think that's worth preaching on. For our Psalm commentary, we've got um, something from an up and coming uh, young Old Testament scholar named Rolf Jacobson. Yes. This is nine years old. And I was reminded as I reread this last night, Rolf, this is one of your best working preacher commentaries ever. Aww. I appreciate that. I Thanks. It's nine years old, but I, but I read it and I was like, I remember reading this one when it came out and learning yeah. a lot. From it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, people should read it. I appreciate that. It's, uh, it, yeah. If you're afraid of the gospel text or don't want to go all the way into Esther, Psalm 19. I said almost everything I have to say about it. But if you, well, it, it doesn't have to be in either or. I mean, 
<laughs> by my Psalms but commentary, I, where I say I think, other things but, about it. <laughs> but I think of one of the, I think one of the really helpful things about the commentary, Rolf, and and in preaching, if you decide not to do any other things, is um, just the, how you unpack the term law, which still just has such uh, incredible misunderstanding and misinterpretation. I think uh, in in most in most uh, parish congregational situations, what does the law mean? And particularly a negative connotation of the law. And so the way that you, you know, it, again, the preacher needs to sense what, what, what needs to be preached on a certain Sunday, but this is an opportunity to uh, uh, do some corrective uh, with regard to what does that term actually mean and why is it so important? I think it could also be read or preached well in tandem with, with Mark 9. I know it wasn't necessarily chosen for that, but who, who knows the mind, the lectionary makers. But, you know, people have got these ideas about Jesus that he somehow is, is against rules or is just telling people to relax and that, uh, you know, just kind of be true to yourself and do your own thing. And why we think that is beyond me, especially looking at the text we're looking at in Mark, where he's very concerned about behavior, where he's uh, quite severe in telling people, don't you dare do something that will harm somebody else. And this, that, this allows a certain kind of reflection on, on God, why God is concerned about human relationships um, because of the great good that can come out of them, the great damage that can come out of them. And so in some ways, what he's talking about here, what the psalmist is talking about here regarding Torah uh, could help with that. This isn't it's not so much to peg Jesus as a liberal or a conservative, whatever those terms might mean to you in the context of the Gospels, but it's to say, what kind of a vision of God's goodness is he trying to recover uh, in the course of his ministry, and how does he have precedence in Scripture as well, and, and this psalm might be one of those. Yeah, uh, one, uh, one thing since I wrote it that I've, I've learned about the text is... Um, there's a great version uh, of part of it by uh, a gospel singer named Jess Ray, um, last name A-R-Y, you can find it on YouTube. And she really focuses in, starting with the, the part, the, the prayer for forgiveness at the end. I do think that the prayer for forgiveness that says, um, clear me from hidden faults, that that in itself is a deep insight. We don't know our own sins often. You know, sometimes we do. Oh, yeah, I really did that to that person. That sucked about me. But a lot of times we don't. And so that there, um, to, uh, the humble life of of seeking forgiveness, even even for that of which we are not aware, um, I think does also m uh, match up with the whole stumbling block part of the gospel lesson. And I think that's actually a great segue to James, uh, because how. James ends, you know, you, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sense of James is this moral advice and, 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 and how is it that you live that out? But then James returns to uh, this, this really communal uh, sense of, of why, why all of this, it's a sense of what it means to be, um, what it means to be uh, a Christian community and what that looks like. And, and then particularly the focus on prayer, you know, how is it possible uh, to how is it possible, all the things that we've already talked about, how is it possible not to be a stumbling block to others? How is it possible to, uh, to take a good hard look at yourself? Uh, all of these things, well, a prayer. And so the, the location of prayer in the letter, if you've been you know, working through James, is I, I think really significant. It's a reminder that the, the possibility to live a life of faith, to follow Jesus, to uh, be a disciple, all of that is made possible through, uh, through the, uh, the power of prayer.